Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning, happy, happy Sabbath. This week's lesson is the stranger in your gates. We're going to learn about all, all about who this stranger is, but before we proceed, Mary, could you open us in prayer? Definitely, I would love to. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're so very grateful for this Sabbath day. We're grateful for the life, for all the blessings that you've given us, and we ask especially for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit to be with us now as we study Deuteronomy deeper, especially in regards to the stranger in our gates. Lord, help us to understand truly the full meaning that you would have us understand on how to treat the strangers and one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so our memory verse for this week is Deuteronomy 10:19. So show your love for the alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. And we know this from the Exodus, and obviously, and it was foretold to Abraham. But I'd like to read Matthew 22, 37 through 40. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now let me ask you, was this something new? Did Jesus just introduce a new teaching? No. No. Because no. in Deuteronomy 6, 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And in Leviticus 19.18, it says, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So why do we love our neighbor as we love ourselves? Because God oh, said so. Exactly. <laughs> and they are made in his image as well. So we obviously know who the Lord is, right? But who is our neighbor? And... How do we define that? So let's look at a parable that may or may not come up today, but Luke um, 10, verses 30 through 37, the Good Samaritan. Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, the Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. Now we know that Abraham was, or Abram was told that and all the families of the earth would be blessed. And that was in Genesis 12, 3. But we also read in Isaiah 42, 6, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. Which nations? All nations. All nations. Israel was to be the light to all nations. And their neighbor were all the nations. In today's lesson, we're going to take a look at the three major themes. The new covenant, although the covenant is everlasting, there will always be a need to renew it, especially when it's been broken, and we're going to cover that. We will see how and why we need to renew the covenant back then and even after Christ's crucifixion. And we'll learn how we can renew that covenant daily in our own lives. For Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Which means he comes to the cross daily to lose himself 
and to let Christ take hold of him. Literally, that is one thing that we will have to do in our lives. We're going to look at a second point here for the theme of this lesson, the circumcision of the heart. Now, we know the circumcision that God told Abraham about in Genesis 17. And it was an outward symbol of the covenant people. We know that this circumcision was symbolic of ridding oneself of the fleshly desires that exist in a sinful nature. But the heart, which actually symbolizes our very character, is what God always wanted to be circumcised. And we read Romans 2, 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he who is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So this verse says that the Holy Spirit actually circumcises your heart. Can't wait to learn more about that. God always wanted us to love him with all of our hearts and all of our soul and all of our strength and all of our mind. He never wanted us to be partially committed to him, but wholly committed to him and him alone. He has always wanted that from the very beginning. And the third theme of today's lesson we're going to look at is to love the stranger. So we are told to love the ones that we normally don't even want to associate with. We will look at who these strangers are and why they are so rejected by the regular populace. How worldviews directly affect this. We all have one. And believe it or not, we all have prejudice. Mm -hmm. What is missing in our heart that is causing that? Maybe a little circumcision. And how the stranger is actually our neighbor. Remember the Good Samaritan, and he was, he was the stranger in that story. Jerusalem and Jericho are both in Judah. He is a stranger in a foreign land, and yet, look at how he acts. He knows who his neighbor is, because when he finds his neighbor, a man, a Jew, a man beaten and bloodied and half naked, that he's never seen before, he recognizes his neighbor. So on that note, let's keep these three themes in mind as we go through this week's lesson. Mary, can you tell us about Sunday and circumcise your hearts? Yes, we're going to dig into that. What does circumcising the heart have to do with the stranger in your gates? And what does it mean to circumcise your heart? Let's continue studying Deuteronomy for answers to these questions. Chapter 10 is a continuation of chapter 9, and Moses is reciting Israel's history. Let's read verses 1 through 5, and then 10 and 11. At that time the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain, and make yourself an ark of wood, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tables in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark, which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Verse 10 says, As at the first time I stayed in the mountain forty days and forty nights, the Lord also heard me at that time. And the Lord chose not to destroy you. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, begin your journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. From what we just read, what helps us understand that God forgave his people their sin and was reaffirming the covenant promise made to them and their fathers? Well, first of all, God asked Moses to cut two stones like the first and come up to him. He asked him to make a wooden ark to store the tablets God would write on them the words that were on the first tablet. The Lord heard Moses and chose not to destroy Israel. And God repeats the covenant promise for them to go in and possess the land. 
What did Moses do with the original ten tablets commandment? In Deuteronomy 9.17, it says, Then I took the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. Moses came down after being on the mount forty days and nights and finds the Israelites blatantly breaking the second commandment and worshiping the golden idol. By throwing down the tablets, Moses signified that the covenant was broken. In Patriarchs and Prophets, we read, to show his abhorrence of their crime, he threw down the tablets of stone, and they were broken in the sight of all Israel, thus signifying that as they had broken their covenant with God, so God had broken, broken his covenant with them. The covenant had been broken, but God initiated a reestablishment, a renewing of that covenant. God had forgiven his people and was going to continue working with them and through them. Next, Moses asks a question of Israel in verses 12 to 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good? Moses asks the people, what does the Lord require? That word require could also be translated requests, desires, or asks of them. He's asking them to fear him or reverence him, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve him with all their heart and soul and keep the commandments. He's essentially repeating Deuteronomy 6, 5, which Byron read earlier. God's confirming what he wants for them for their good. Now, how are they going to give to God what he's requesting from them? The answer to this question is in verses 14 to 16. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth, with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, that was them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. So everything on this earth and in the universe belonged to God. He delighted in their fathers to love them. There's God's everlasting love theme once again. He chose them, their descendants, above all peoples, and he's asking them to respond to God's delight and love toward them by circumcising the foreskin of their heart and no longer being stiff-necked. Verse 16 is God's call to action. What is the meaning of these images? Circumcision was an outward sign of the covenant made with God, as Byron mentioned in Genesis 17:11. But circumcise the foreskin of your heart? Are we naturally born with a heart that can be circumcised or do we need a new heart? In Ezekiel 36, we read, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. God's word says, we have a heart of stone, but he will take it out and give us a new heart of flesh. And notice it comes with a new spirit. This is the first thing we need. The circumcision of the heart is an image that symbolizes the inner circumcision that Paul will describe later as the conversion of the Christian. In Romans 2.29 as Byron read, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. Once again, the spirit is involved, and this is a procedure that only God can perform. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 says, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. God does everything. What does stiff-necked mean? Stubborn, hmm. intractable, obstinate. We're not like that, are we? Not today. Never. No. <laughs>
Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Israel was very much like that, as we are. And King Hezekiah said in Chronicles 38, listen to what he said about stiff-necked. Now do not be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord. Here we see a connection with yielding or submitting ourselves to the Lord. And Stephen said in Acts 7.51, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. A stiff-necked character resists the Holy Spirit and is indicative of an uncircumcised heart. In summary, what God did with literal Israel thousands of years ago, he offers spiritual Israel today. God forgave the Israelites' sin at Mount Sinai and all during the 40 years in the wilderness and reestablished the covenant with them along with all its promises. God forgives our sins and offers us eternity with him. Secondly, God informed the Israelites of what he requires of them to love and serve him with all their hearts and keep his commandments. And he requests the same from us. And lastly, God invited them to accept the circumcised heart of flesh that only he can provide them and yield themselves to his Holy Spirit. The same invitation is extended to us. We're called to root our commitments in our hearts. Only love will make this commitment possible and only by this process of circumcising our hearts can we be prepared to love the stranger that is in our gates. And with that, I'll hand it over to Greg. Amen. Amen. Greg, tell us about love the stranger. I will do that. Thank you, Byron. Thank you, Mary, for that wonderful lesson. And good morning again, everyone, and happy Sabbath. And as Byron had mentioned, in Monday's lesson, it's titled Love the Stranger. And God tells us, we're going to get right into this. God tells us in Deuteronomy 10, 14, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. And in Psalms 24, 1, God tells us that the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So all of heaven and earth and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. But God also reveals a little bit more about himself in Deuteronomy 10, verses 17 through 19. So let's read that. For the Lord your God is God of God, God's and Lord of Lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He ministers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And the word stranger in Hebrew is ger. And that simply means a foreigner. It means a newcomer, someone who may be lacking in inherited rights. So it's basically anybody who is from the outside. It could be from the city next to you. It could be down the street from you. So in all practical reasons, it really means your neighbor from wherever they may come from. So what additional information did God reveal about himself in the verses that we just read? Well, he said that he is the only God. There are no other gods. He declares his supremacy over all powers, real or imagined. He is it. God also tells us that he can't be bought off and that he shows no partiality. So in other words, if you're wealthy, highly educated, or hold a particular office or title or position in business or even in your local community, that's not going to impress the Lord, uh, nor is that going to result in favoritism from him to you because God cares about us all equally, including the poor, the fatherless, the widows, and the stranger. We are all his, and he loves us all regardless of earthly circumstances. And remember, as we learn throughout Scripture and as we've learned in Deuteronomy, God doesn't love any of us more or less and isn't impressed with what we do here. And again, as we had mentioned, he shows no favoritism to others based on personal accomplishments or works or status. What he's looking for instead is he wants our willing hearts and minds. 
That's what he wants. So God is telling the Israelites this. And you have to keep in mind, too, the Israelites were about ready to go into the promised land. And their predecessors made a lot of mistakes. And their hearts were not circumcised as Mary went through. Their hearts were not circumcised and they were stiff-necked. So he's telling these people, look, listen to what I'm telling you. And listen to what I'm telling you about the stranger within your gate. You need to love them. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this. We're going to get to um, uh, a little bit more detail. But let me just say this. God is telling the Israelites and letting them know that, yes, they're special people and that God set them aside for a purpose. Byron mentioned that at the opening. But they weren't special people for anything that they did or that they were. And we, you could read about that in uh, Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8, and also in Deuteronomy 9, verses 4 through 6. But they were special people set aside because of a promise made to their forefathers. They were to be, as Byron had mentioned, to be representatives to the world about God and about his character, about who he is. They were supposed to teach the world about him and his love for humanity, not just them. Of course he loved them, but he loves us all. Even those who we consider to be on the fringes of society. When you think about it, it's a, it's a beautiful lesson that God is trying to teach us, that his love is for all of humanity. And why was God telling the Israelites this? And what is, why does he want us to know this? Well, it's important, as I mentioned, because God loves all of us. Again, he loves the poor, the needy, the helpless. And just as he loves them, we should love them too. Mm -hmm. Is it easy to love good people? Yes. Is it easy to love those who aren't good people? No, it's not. Not without God's love and his character working within us. We can't do that on our own. Think of it. How many times do you go by someone with an outstretched hand or someone who is in need, someone who's on the fringes, and you just walk by thinking, oh, they're not going to notice me? How easy is that? How lovable is that? Think about this. If someone new comes to church and they pull up in a really nice car, they have really nice clothes on, how quickly do they receive attention and are befriended? What about the person who pulls up on a bike or a clunker of a car? What about if they're not well-dressed? What if they are in need of personal hygiene, a shower? How quickly are they befriended? So it's easy to love the, those who have an appealing presence, but it's more difficult to treat those who may appear to be less appealing with that same love and kindness. But this is what Jesus is trying to teach us about him. We are all equal in his eyes. He wants us to treat them just as he would, but in our sinful nature, we're not able to do that. We need to ask Jesus to help us. We need his Amen. help. We need his love so that we can love those. When we look at John 13, verse 34, Jesus is saying here, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Think about that. Jesus wants us to love others, those who are on the fringes, to love them as much as Jesus loves us. So in closing, I just want us to read Psalms 145, I'm sorry, Psalms 146, verses 5 through 10. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, not just to ancient Israel, to all generations. Praise the Lord. And so to love the stranger, to love a neighbor, is part of our covenant obligation. It is the second 
greatest commandment, to love our neighbor as ourselves. So we need to ask God to help us, to change our hearts, to change our minds, so that we too can love the stranger. So yeah. that said, I will turn it back over to Byron. Thank you. Amen. Tuesday, for you were strangers in Egypt. So we're going to read the verse from the lesson, um, Deuteronomy 10, 19. So show your love for the alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I know we've heard it before, but I love this verse because God is telling Israel, remember where you came from and how you got to where you are. Remember that God started out with a Chaldean named Abram. Remember, and then before they went down to Egypt, um, Genesis 46, 27 tells us that the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. And all, all the persons of the house of Jacob came, or who came to Egypt were 70. Now, mind you, that early in the verse it says, or early in scripture it says that the wives were not included, though. Mm -hmm. So maybe 80, 90 tops. At the end, when they leave, in Numbers 146 tells us that 603,550 men, 20 years older, or 20 years or older, were present. That didn't include the Levites. Mm -hmm. So. God obviously, his promise to Abraham was truly fulfilled. He did create a great nation with descendants as, as if you could count the stars. But what did the Egyptians think of the Hebrews? Or read Genesis 46, 34. And you shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from your, our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, that you may live in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. And, just, and that word loathsome actually translates literally as an abomination. Genesis 43, 32 also says, So they served him by himself, and them by themselves. This is when Benjamin comes back down with the brothers to Egypt. And the Egyptians who ate with them by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is loathsome or an abomination to the Egyptians as well. So they're at the bottom of the bucket. They literally, you can't go any lower in Egyptian society. So what else does that remind you of? The Egyptians wouldn't even eat with them. Remember the Pharisees during Jesus' time? about Gentiles and Samaritans, they wouldn't even deal with them as yeah. either. That same mentality carries through, doesn't it? Even when God caused the Hebrew population to explode, and they were still an abomination to the Egyptians, though, marginalized on the fringe of society, condemned to slavery for all the generations to come. So why did God allow Israel and the Hebrews to be strangers and slaves in Egypt? What benefit could come from this? In the world during this time, it was normal, this kind of structure. We read in Matthew 2.25, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. You've always had the rich and the powerful keeping somebody down to make a profit from them in some way or shape or form. Then there was the order, that was the order or status for the people in the ancient world. And that oppression that comes with it is what's exercised on the weaker ones. Do we see that today? We do. Nothing's changed much, has it? Sin is sin. But God wanted Israel to be different. He wanted them to know how wrong it was in his eyes. He wanted Israel to experience what it was like to be on the wrong side of injustice. So when they were on top, per se, because of God, obviously, they would not do the same to others. Leviticus 19.18 says, You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, which we read in the opening. Matthew 7.12 says, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Jesus died for everyone, Amen. including the strangers, 
because he loves us all the same, because we are all created in his image. And in 2 Corinthians 5.15, and he died for all so that they who, might, they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Scripture makes it so clear. But what, do they, what does God want for them? In Ephesians 1.11 says, Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. So if God wants everyone to be saved, he's predestined everyone to be saved. We just don't always go along with that. And he has a purpose for everyone on this earth. And Ephesians 5.1, if Jesus didn't discriminate, G Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Could you picture Jesus looking down on people? On the marginalized fringe, thinking that they're not worth anything? Thinking that they're somehow inferior? The best story from this is Ruth. I'm going to read Ruth um, 2 through 10, or chapter 2, verses 7 through 10 and 22. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. I've heard sermons on this verse. Why isn't Ruth out gleaning in the field? The fact that she's sitting under a shelter, basically, a house can also be translated as shelter. More than likely, they realize she's a Moabite, and even the servants rank higher than her. So more than likely, she heard something that wasn't real good, and she's kind of keeping a low profile. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Safety in numbers. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap. And go after them, indeed. I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? She knows exactly what her position is. In verse 22, Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maids so that others do not fall upon you in another field. So she's actually experiencing persecution firsthand because she is a Moabite. She knew her status. She knew how vulnerable she was. The um, Syrophoenician woman is my favorite example, though, and this is the example that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. And a Canaanite woman from the region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he, but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh boy, they're loving that, aren't they? <laughs> Verse 25, but she came and began to bow down before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Mm -hmm. Once again, his mm -hmm. disciples are cheering him on secretly, I believe. But she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done as you, or for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. This is exactly what the lesson is about. And this is exactly what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples, his apostles. It was a perfect object lesson for them. It's how God looks at people. Have you ever been on the, on the receiving end of injustice? If so, how did it feel? So now we have to ask ourselves, who is our Ruth or our Syrophoenician woman? It could be the homeless, those that are less affluent or intellectual. It could be based on race. Much of it is. There are many things in each 
one of our worldviews that makes us prejudiced to others, whether we know it or not. And we all have some form of it. Our only hope is to be imitators of Jesus by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Amen. To have that circumcised heart. Amen. So that we may represent Christ properly on this earth to others. Mary, can you tell us about Wednesday? Judge righteously. Yes, we're going to continue on this theme of loving our neighbor and a stranger. It could be the stranger among us and focus on judging righteously. As Christians, we are to reflect the character of God. We were made in the image of God, according to Genesis 1.27. And Galatians 4.19, Paul wrote, My little children to whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Moses, talking about God, said he doesn't take a bribe and he cares about the weak and the outcast. And if God does this, we need to do the same. Let's read some verses in Deuteronomy and pick out a common theme here. Deuteronomy 1.16 says, Then I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the stranger who is with him. Deuteronomy 16.19, You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the, right of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. 24.17, you shall not pervert justice, do the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. And lastly, chapter 27.19, cursed is the one who perverts the justice, do the stranger, the fatherless, and widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. The common theme in all these verses is to judge righteously, to not pervert justice by showing partiality or bias to one person over the other, not only among brethren, but also with strangers. Does this happen? Do the weak, poor, and outcasts get the same kind of justice in most human courts as do those with money, power, connections, and influence? No matter how lofty the principles of justice and equity that are enshrined in constitutions or laws, what's the reality in our world? The poor, the weak, and the outcasts almost never get the justice that others do. It's amazing that God is saying here to his people, this unfairness that exists throughout other societies and cultures should not exist among his people those who are to represent him to the world. God wanted equal justice under the law in ancient Israel. Did that happen? They had the knowledge and revelation of the true God, and they were given the correct forms of worship and brought the proper offerings. This was all good. But what good was all that if they were mistreating each other, especially the weak and poor among them? Again and again in messages conveyed through the prophets, the Lord railed against the oppressors of the poor and the needy in Israel. Let's read what God said through Amos and Isaiah. In Amos 4.1, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring wine, let us drink. And then 5.11, therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. And then Isaiah says, woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune, which they have prescribed to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. Something went wrong. Despite God's instructions, Israel exercised injustice. They didn't realize this equality of justice went beyond jurisprudence, beyond their system of law. Let's keep in mind what God had told them as well. In Leviticus 19.2, it 
Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Holiness was to be the foundation of their high standards of justice and the foundation of their interactions with one another. How were they to obtain this holiness? Let's look at the example of Moses and the 70 elders. In Numbers 11, the Israelites are complaining to Moses, and he tells God that he's not able to put up with these people alone. That burden is too heavy for him. God answered and asked him to gather 70 of the elders of Israel and bring them to the tabernacle. They would help judge and rule the people. In verse 25, it says, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. This is extremely important to remember. God must give us of his Holy Spirit. He must be abiding within us in order for us to judge righteously in all our interactions with others. How can we be holy and mistreat others at the same time. We can't, regardless of how strictly we adhere to proper religious rituals. We need to remember that we can only judge righteously if we have the Holy Spirit abiding in us. In closing, judging righteously has to do with how we treat one another. And as our society and culture continue to drastically change and incorporate godless principles, we need to remember that God is calling us to a higher standard of holiness. But he doesn't leave us alone to attempt to reach this standard. In Testimonies to the Church, we read, Erring man cannot judge righteously unless his heart is constantly imbued with the Spirit of God. May we constantly seek the Spirit of God to guide us in our interactions with one another. With Thank that, you, I will hand it back over to Greg. Amen. Thank you, Mary. That was um, a very good lesson in understanding that there's things that we can't control, such as the courts, things like that. But what we can do is we can choose to put our trust and faith in the Lord and let him change us. And Thursday's lesson is titled, Pure Religion Before God. So this is really where the rubber meets the road. So what does this mean, pure religion before God? What should it mean to us as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians? Well, that's exactly what we're going to explore today. And we're going to go through two primary scripture readings. So just two, but they're both a little lengthy. So just bear with me. The first one is Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 10 through 15. So just follow along with me on your screen, or you could open your Bibles and join us that way. When you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house to get his pledge. He shall stand outside, and the man to whom you lend shall bring the pledge out to you. And if the man is poor, you shall not keep his pledge overnight. You shall in any case return the pledge to him again when the sun goes down, that he may not sleep in his own garment, and bless you. And it shall be righteousness to you before the Lord your God. So again, you don't want to keep what he pledged. You want to give it back to him if it was a garment. You want to make sure to give it back to him by sunset so that that way he doesn't do without. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your own brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates. Each day you shall give him his wages and not let the sun go down on it, for he is poor and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to the Lord and it be sin to you. So there are two important principles that we're talking about here. And the first one is to treat people with dignity and respect. If someone owes you something, we owe it to them to be respectful and treat them with dignity and not forcefully exert ourselves in the position that we are as the lender coming to collect what is due to me. It's disrespectful. Think of who may be around them watching, perhaps their children, their spouse, their relatives, or their friends. How would you like that? How would you like to be treated adversely if you owed somebody something and they came up to you in a disrespectful manner in front of your loved ones or friends or colleagues. So we have to keep that in mind. Treat that person with dignity and with some respect. 
Isn't that how you'd like to be treated? And second is, if someone is working under your authority, don't oppress them, especially if they are poor and needy, as they are particularly vulnerable, especially in today. We could see that all around us. If we go and hire day workers, and they're desperate for work, but they're willing to work to put food on the table, don't disrespect them, and don't take advantage of them. Just knowing that they're in a difficult position, many people feel that that's where they can get more for their money. Is that what Jesus would do? So whether they're a brother in the church or a stranger, it makes no difference. Do we ever take advantage of people? Well, like I just said, we do take advantage of people, the poor and the needy, sometimes when we hire them for work. But we need to pray to the Lord to change our hearts, change our minds, so we don't do that. Don't overwork them. Do you overwork them when you hire them? Or underpay them because you can? Or what about postponing their payment so that it's convenient for you? So the point is, when we give someone our word, whether they are poor and needy, as a day laborer might be, or someone who we've contracted services with, who perhaps may not be needy or poor. The principle is still the same. Treat people honestly. That's what Jesus wants us to do with dignity and respect, and especially be mindful of those who are poor and needy. And don't hold back until tomorrow what you have promised them today. Remember, going against either of these principles is sin in God's eye. And I want to look at this a little bit more in depthly with a little bit more boldness and clarity. So let's go to the book of James. I love James because James is one who thinks straight and talks straight. There's no muddling of his words. So we'll go to the book of James. We'll go to chapter 1, but let's go to the very last verse, verse 27, and then we'll continue into chapter 2 to verse 11. Okay, so that's James 1, verse 27 through 2, verse 11, and I'll read. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the, and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man with filthy clothes. We talked about this in Monday's lesson. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with the evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Yes, he has. But have you dishonored the poor men? Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? How is that today? It's very relevant for us today. Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love the Lord as yourself. You do well, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the, trans, by the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. So James is telling us here something that just directly parallels with Deuteronomy. James links the mistreatment of the poor with the Ten Commandments. Although there's nothing specifically stated about treating the poor in the Ten Commandments, the last six commandments have to do with treating one another. So how does this great principle relate to the two greatest commandments? Well, as we know, the Ten Commandments are summed up with the two greatest commandments, right? That's Matthew 22, verses 38 through 40. And that is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your soul, and all your strength. And the second one is just like that, to love your neighbor as yourself. We think we can keep the letter of the law while at the same time mistreating others, and in particular, mistreating the needy and the poor. What this does is this makes a mockery, uh, a mockery and a hypocrisy of us individually and also of our religion, of Christianity. 
of our proclamation of being followers and believers in Jesus Christ. It makes a mockery of our profession of faith in God. It makes a mockery of claiming to keep the Ten Commandments. Loving our neighbors as ourselves is revealed in how we treat one another. And God especially draws our attention to how we treat the marginalized, the poor, and the needy. And what James stated in the verses we just read, it does go hand in hand with what God tells us in the book of Deuteronomy. God doesn't discern our worthiness on entering his heavenly kingdom or the Israelites in entering the promised land on whether we're rich or poor, but on our worthiness of the kingdom is evidenced by our character and how we love God and how we love our neighbor. The proof of how we love our neighbor is manifested in how we treat one another and in particular how we treat the poor and the needy and the marginalized of our society. So how do we as a church, how do you and I individually treat those who are different than us? I'm talking about treating those from all walks of life, all circumstances that we may not have gone through that they have. And I'm talking about including the homeless, the drug addicts, the alcoholics. What about those in the gay community? How are we treating them? It doesn't mean compromising one bit on God's word, not at all, or any of his principles, but it's how we uphold his law and principles. The question is, is Jesus living within us? Again, this is evidenced by how we treat one another. So we have to ask ourselves, is Jesus living in us? It's about a heart restoration in him and by him. This is the pure religion before God, as in today's title, pure religion before God. This is the pure religion before God that he wants us to understand. So that said, I'll turn it back to you, Byron. Okay, Mary, do you have any final thoughts? Um, just for us to remember circumcision of the heart, I think is the first thing, the most important thing, once we let the Holy Spirit come in and God to... Um, start transforming our character, then all of these other ways in which we interact and we treat other people will automatically flow in a righteous, holy way. Amen. And I would like to read two um, quotes from Ellen White, and one is a ground-laying part, or the, actually laying the foundation for the second one. So the first quote is from the Review and Herald, October 29th, 1914. There is, a, and this was actually towards, I would say, people of other countries and things like that, but it's applicable in different ways. There is a great work before us. The world is to be warned. The truth is to be translated into many languages that all nations may enjoy its pure, life-giving influence. This work calls for the exercise of all the talents that God has entrusted to our keeping. That's you, me, and everyone watching. The pen, the press, the voice, the purse, needs funding, and the sanctified affections of the soul. Christ has made us ambassadors to make known his salvation till the children of men. And which children are those? All, All children. children. And if we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the joy of his indwelling spirit, we shall not be able to hold our peace. So let me ask you, how many of us, and that, this is pointed towards me, cannot stop talking about Jesus? Something to think about. And then the second quote is from Testimonies for the Church, um, chapter 8, um, 8 and then 34 through 36 from 1904. Wake up, wake up, my brethren and sisters, and enter the fields in America that have never been worked. After you have given something for foreign fields, do not think your duty done. In other words, missionary work. There is a work to be done in foreign fields, but there is a work to be done in America that is just as important. In the cities of America, there are people of almost every language, and I'm going to add on to that, every social status and every, every race, creed, and nationality. 
These need the light that God has given to his church. This is a call for us to learn to love the way that God loves. So if you see that stranger, whether it's someone from a foreign country or someone new or even someone who can sometimes be a little annoying, remember that God loves all of us the same and that God loves that person too. Amen. So with that thought, if they do not know about God, who's going to tell them? We're supposed to save a perishing world. So that's kind of a conviction for us, for me. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this Sabbath day, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the wisdom that comes with it. Teach us, Lord, to surrender to you, to truly have circumcised hearts, that the Holy Spirit may dwell in us and do your work of transformation in us, Lord. By beholding, we are transformed more and more into your likeness. So guide us, Lord, that we truly embrace it and not only know it, Lord, many people know it, but that we speak it and we act it, Amen. that we do your good pleasure on this earth, that we truly imitate Christ as our example. Jesus was a rule breaker. He was a boat rocker. He was many things, but he was holy and pure in your righteousness. Teach us to stand firm in you, Lord that we may profess boldly to others and to not, not look at others differently, but to see everyone, Lord, the homeless, whoever it may be, as that image that you created in Eden. We pray and ask that the Holy Spirit may protect and keep everyone safe in this ever-changing world, Lord, and that each person watching this may truly have a revelation that brings them closer to God. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.